actually involves real fire. Michael Kukula is going to be doing some amazing uh, pattern welding here. Uh, he's going to walk you through uh, multi-bar CX that he's been putting together. And I have to admit, uh, the behind the scenes is going to show some interesting chaos right before this, uh, this one. Uh, we were uh, last minute scrambling to get together, but we made it on time. Um, big announcement. This is the presentation that I will be asking the secret question that the first three people who email the following email address, which will magically appear on your screen at this moment, if you email the correct answer to this, the first three people that email the correct answer will receive the three knives that will be the product of the Railroad Spike Forging Competition. To give you an example of what a Railroad Spike looks like, and not a typical one at all, this was forged by Master Smith Peter Johnson. This is a Roman C blade. Look at the shape of this blade. Now, of course, this will be the, the blade that comes out of the competition will actually have an edge ground on it and so on. But the level of precision and skill that went into forging this out of a railroad spike is quite something. This is the level of creativity and quality that you can expect to see out of the competition. So these will be quite something. You're going to want one. So remember, at some point, I'm going to jump in and say a question. And the first three people that even email that answer we're going to win one of these three blades we're going to make tomorrow at, during the competition. Now, something important occurred to us during the break. Commercials are playing for some of you. And, and the thing that's strange about Ustream is the commercials play at random times, or apparently random times, for each viewer. So it's possible that when I'm asking the question, a Gatorade commercial could be on your screen, which would be very frustrating, we realize. So, and because this competition is open for members of Middle Earth Network only, if you log on to the community chat room, Right now on the Middle Earth Network, when I ask the question, the minute I'm done asking the question, our producer is going to click the button. He's already got it typed into the chat room. He's going to click answer, so that question is going to pop up on the screen at the same time you'd hear it if I was announcing it uh, live. So we're going to try and make this as fair as possible given the technical limitations. So keep your eyes peeled, and with that, give it away to Michael Bakula. Take it, Mike. Holy cow. All right. So... Uh, what I decided to do at the last minute is instead of uh, doing sword fittings, is fire, and I uh, came up with some pattern welded uh, steel. We welded the billet together when I first got here, uh, whatever day it was, the day before yesterday, and then we just slowly started working, and then I'm like, holy cow, I'm going to do a composite weld, so better get to work. Uh, it's basically, there's six pieces in here. These twisted sections right here are where the rod was twisted and the pattern is manipulated. The other sections, the laminate should be straight all the way across, and there's three bars over here, and when you flip it over, there's another three bars. Oh my god, what happened there? Well, it sheared, because you know what? That's just the way Murphy rolls, but I don't care. I'm going to still weld it together, and it's going to be awesome. So, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this in the forge, I'm going to put some flux on it. And once it gets up to temperature, I'm going to start compressing it with the hammer and hopefully get some welds that are going to settle. Once the steel starts to pick up a little bit of color, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sprinkle some 20 mule team borax over the surface and that does two things. It prevents the surface from oxidizing because it covers it and prevents oxygen from getting there and then that scale doesn't build up and the scale that is on there, it lowers the melting temperature so hopefully when I compress it with the hammer, it all squeezes right out and I get a nice clean uh, surfaces of the two metals that are going to come together and fuse. So. You'll notice that in the forge, if you're kind of seeing what the rods are doing, is they're all expanding and all those, uh, that tight cluster kind of bleh, all opened up. So as it starts to get up to temperature, I'm going to reach in there with a pair of tongs and I'm going to start squeezing it together to kind of consolidate it. And as soon as those surfaces start to touch, it'll lightly start to weld to itself. So essentially when I'm taking it out, it's already starting, starting to think about behaving like one piece and I don't have to worry about trying to compress it on the anvil as I'm losing heat and all kinds of crazy stuff is going on.
we're just about at temperature and we're going to swing over to the anvil. Just gently compress it because forge welding is really about compression. You don't want to be hitting it, you just want to get those surfaces to just stick together. Now it's always a good idea to keep your workpiece nice and clean as you work. And how you do that is with a wire brush you go over the surface, but all that slag that's on there and all the flux sticks to the bristles like glass. So all you do is you grab your brush, dip it in water, and it breaks that scale away. It helps clean it up and it doesn't stick to your bristles, so it saves you on wire brushes. The welding operation never happens in one heat. You want to do it over several heats. What you're doing is as those welds are starting to form, the grains are starting to form in between those boundaries so that it all starts to come together nice and even. And as soon as those boundaries start to disappear and the grains grow, it becomes a lot stronger and more, co more coherent. set of compression blows. Hey Michael, can I ask you a question? Sure. Why are you using the big hammer? We were wondering over here, instead of a smaller hammer to tap the brush. Because I'm worried about compression, I don't want to be torching it, and with the big hammer I can just let it drop down, and the weight of it will actually push, so all I'm basically doing is the same motion. You're decreasing velocity and relying more on the mass to actually, ah, Yep. That makes perfect sense. But now that I believe it's welded, let's do a little bit more blows with a heavier or a lighter hammer. Start to see how it behaves. I'm moving the piece and I'm hammering in the same location on the anvil. That helps keep everything nice and flat. And that basically whenever you have a tool like a press or a power hammer, you're mimicking the same motion. You're moving the work piece and the blow is going to the same spot. It also helps to keep your work piece a little bit flatter. You want to take a little shot of that. It's looking nice and solid. It's behaving really well. And that one spot that was uh, broken, that Murphy decided to screw me up on, ah, I can just barely make it out right there. I don't think it's going to be too much of a problem. We're going to give it some squeezes in the press. And then, uh, yeah, clean it up a little bit, slap an edge on it, and do a little bit more welding. second, Michael. Yeah. Time for the question. Are you ready? Why did Tolkien love the bright sword? One more time. Why did Tolkien, as in J.R.R., who wrote The Lord of the Rings, love the bright sword? Email your answers right now to this address. First three, get the blades. Good luck, guys.
really just squeezed it together, you can see that some of those areas in between the rods are starting to close up. I'm gonna give it one more heat, let it soak, give it in a couple more squeezes, and then we'll start putting it to the final dimension that'll match our, uh, our edge piece. coming up to temperature. Uh, what we have here is we have a layer, uh, a billet that just has a random pattern in it. This is the material we're going to weld onto that core and this is going to make up the edge of the sacks. Now this is a little bit bigger than that bar and I'm not too worried about it because whatever dimension I get from that bar I can just cut this down and then I'm ready to go. So after I give that one more squeeze I'm going to put this in the press with it as a guide so that it ends up the same thickness in this direction as what I'm working with now. If I had this thicker, I might be able to put that on and do the welding operation in one heat. But with this being thinner and that being thicker, it just wasn't gonna work, especially since uh, our rods, I didn't really take all the time in the world to prepare them since we were on a time restraint. So, but hey, you know, the welds are looking good, so I am not worried at all. Part of blacksmithing is don't worry about it. Just go with the flow. If the material is going to weld, it's going to weld. If it isn't, there's nothing you can do except for waste more time and frustration than you know what to do with. That's pretty close in the thickness. Uh, I think one more heat to clean it up and give everything nice and straight. And I think we'll be able to uh, combine these two, weld them together, and start working on uh, shaping a sax. Actually, yeah, yeah, I think we're okay. the angle grinder anywhere? the length of this bar that we need. And 
same as this soaks. I'm gonna go cut this really quick. This edge for me. You got it. Sweet. So what I'm going to do here, guys, is I'm going to go and just grind that edge clean. And I, I got to tell you something here, guys. The level of skill that Michael is showing by welding a multi-bar with this level of thinness is insane. It really is. I, I could not pull this off. No way, no. Heck, seriously. This edge or that edge? Doesn't matter. All right, so now this is going to be ready to get that edge welded on. It is looking awesome. I'm liking it. There's a lot of places that you can start to see that twist pattern pop in through the scale. That Murphy decided to leave his mark on the project. That's alright, we're not too worried about it right now for the most part. This is just trying to show the process and the work that goes into this because we've had a lot of pictures and images of, you know, here's the process and I just thought it'd be kind of cool to see this actually happen in person, so. Cool, can you do, uh, let's see, let's do this, this edge right here. So then as soon as Dave gets back with the second piece, I'm going to do a make attack on the two ends just to build it all together. And then from that point, I'm going to put it back in the forge, flux it, and then weld it together, just like I did the, uh, the first time. Except right now, there's only one surface that needs to be welded as opposed to, you know, however many surfaces is from all those six bars that came together. Thank you. common application that uh, blacksmiths or bladesmiths do. We just had those two billets and now he's tack welding them together with a you know, regular modern MIG welder. Uh, you could do this also by taking heavy wire and twisting it together to hold it together. You just need something to hold it together uh, so when the, so the two pieces will be right there in the, next to each other in the fire so he can strike them together. His, the billet that he had when he started out the broadcast was already MIG welded together. MIG is the type of modern welder he's using right over there right now. So, uh, so yeah, he's just tacking those together right now. When he comes back and put it in the fire, he's effectively going to repeat the same operation he started with, which is welding those disparate pieces into one homogeneous piece. This is a uh, relatively complex multi-bar because he started out with, I think it was six bars on top. I could be wrong, maybe it's four. On top, and then one on the bottom. And here comes Michael. I'll give you back to him. 
So now we've got the two pieces. There's a little gap there. I'm not worried about it. As soon as I put that in the forge and start compressing, that's going to close up really nice. So pop her in the forge. So it is kind of weird, as uh, all these other presenters have been saying, to be talking about what you're doing as you're doing it, because a lot of times in the smithy, it's just you get caught up in this pattern, you get in your zone, and sometimes you don't even really know why it is that you're doing what it's doing. You're just, you just are processing everything as it comes in, and you're just trying to find the best solution with the best skills that you possibly can, and it's just kind of, Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. You just kind of have to let the process take its toll through you. It's almost like you're a, you're a vessel for the creation of this. You can't force it. It's almost like uh, the steel has a mind of its own, and it's a partnership, you know. It's all about give and take, and you just have to find this right balance, and hopefully things come together. And it's, you know, a whole bunch of trial and error. But at the end of the day, it always has to pay off. just about at temperature. So I'm going to pull this out and start working it. And the more you work steel, the more the surface that you hammer on, it kind of deforms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the, uh, the six layer billet, the spine, on the base of the anvil and I'm going to be hammering on the edge because if there's a little divot in the edge billet from a hammer blow, that's not a big deal. But if it happens on the spine, that'll uh, that will show as a deformation in those layers. my first series of hammer blows it's more to kind of join and set the surfaces of the steel together than actually do out full welding heats or not welding heats but welding blows I should say I could give a little bit more force
now, due to the length of the forge, I'm pretty sure that the, let's say maybe the seven eighths of the blade at the tip or at the billet is now welded, but there's still an area all the way at the back that isn't. That's just because I couldn't get a full heat over the entire, uh, over the entire length. So it's kind of, you got to work it in sections. And when you're working on a sword size piece, there's no way to do everything in one heat. So you got to take it in sections and you got to overlap your welds. So you're starting from a welded point in the blade and you're just working your way back towards the end, towards the handle. area down by the very bottom is all welded together and nice and solid so at this point I'm ready to uh, give it a one more wire brushing get the surface nice and clean and then I can start working into I don't know I guess something that resembles a blade what am I gonna do let's make another <laughs> Is that a challenge? Hey Dave, do we have a sledgehammer for striking? Last time I had a sledgehammer, you yelled at me, remember? You're screaming at me in German. Did you understand what I was saying? Well, I, I was, I, my blow started doing it in the right order, yeah. <laughs> No, uh, we have presses, that's why we don't have hammers around here. And we work by ourselves, so, yeah. Um, I have a splitting mall for the back end. It's very much like a hammer. You just have to be careful of that back swing, you know? If you find a striker that's willing to strike with it, sure. I'll do it. All right. I'll go grab it. <laughs> now this, you should not try at home. Hold on. The, the, the piece is ready? The splitting mall, okay? Okay, all right. I do want glasses, yes. I want a face shield. <laughs> I want a helmet. So I'm just uh, squeezing this in the press. Kind of clean it up, make sure my surfaces are nice and flat. You make sure really that... Uh, if there are any welds, I want them to open up with me. Because if I have somebody striking for me and the weld open up, obviously it's not my fault. It has to be the striker's fault. Because, uh, yeah, I never do anything wrong and I'm always right. You got more action in your hair. It looks awesome. So, uh, I guess before we start striking on this, now that it's all solid and welded, we're actually going to be able to do something with it. Let's uh, let's kind of take a look 
at what's going on and what kind of shape we want to make with it. So you have a general idea of what it is that we're trying to do and where we're going to go with this. So, whiteboard. He's going to the whiteboard, Andy. So this is our, uh, our cross section of the blade. These are the first six rods that we weld up at the beginning. This is our edge billet. Uh, Dave, what kind of sex do you feel uh, feel is beautiful? Scram socks. A what? Scram socks. Okay, so maybe we'll just do like a broke back to keep it easy. So uh, the general shape of a broke back sax, we have our tang here. This is our spine. This is our edge. Oh, you know, we should totally put in a little Owen Bush curve. Oh. This as a shout out to Owen. A bush, a bush notch? Yeah. A bush notch? All right, let's, let's do it with a bush notch. Owen. When I say Owen, you say Bush. Owen. Bush. Owen. Bush. Owen. Bush. <laughs> with saxes in this tip section right here, the easiest way is really just to cut an angle off the end of our bar. So let's see here. That's our spine, this is our edge. So we're just gonna go in with a chisel at first and make a diagonal cut right here, and that's gonna give us our basic shape. And we're gonna start forging this edge bevel down. That's gonna give us our cross section, then we're gonna work on forging out the tang, and then we'll do our final adjustments to the profile, and uh, yeah, I guess we'll see how far we get in the next 20, I, 25 I minutes. I have beveling guys. Nah, that's boring. Um, we do need the hot cut chisel though. Why? To cut the tip. Ah, oh, alright, I, I, we can do that. Why not? We got a hammer here. I mean, yeah, or we could do the chisel. It's up to you, man. Well, I mean, that's kind of a chisel edge. Yeah, I, I took the, uh, took most of the edge off. Right? Oh, that, it'll cut. Yeah. It'll cut. Yeah. We'll do it. Alright, right on. So uh, we're not going to be able to get to the point where I can grind this blade and etch it and you can see the pattern before, oh, I don't know, the next 20 minutes. So hopefully uh, I'm going to just kind of keep working on this as time allows after we're off air. And hopefully sometime before the event is completely uh, finished, we'll at least be able to show you a bit of what's going on, what the pattern looks like, and what's going on in the steel. So and we'll post photos of that in the media archive section on the arcticfire2012.com website. Plus, you know, it'd be kind of nice to see what all this effort is going to produce. Of course, if it goes bad, we might not post pictures. Yeah, we, no, we, <laughs> it will not go bad, but we, we may forget to post the pictures. No, no, we can't say that it won't go bad. Or, wait, I'm just trying to avoid just Murphy again. Nice. Are we cutting or are we striking? Uh, you'll position and then I'll just strike on the top of the mall. Yeah, we're, so we're cut cutting? Or the other way. I thought, I'm going to put it on the anvil. You put the edge on the piece. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. So let's see here. That's our s other way. Oh. Eh, we're going to position this guy. Like that. All right. Back it up a little bit. So, uh, a little education. This is going to be awesome. So, when you're doing a hot cut and you have the edge of surface, you're, I'm going to strike over here. Now, to move this back and forth, what you're going to do is you're going to lift the handle up and you're just going to be rocking the blade through the curve. Got it. So, instead of moving it, you're just going to rock it forward and back, and that way it follows that first curve that we made. And it'll give us a nice straight cut. Okay. I use my bandsaw when I do that. <laughs> this is too hot for the bandsaw. I let it cool first. Yeah. We don't have time for that. Break time! No, just <laughs> is 
there plastic on the back of that? On the mall? Nah, it's fine. It looks like an enamel of some kind. Okay. Actually, finish it off on the yeah. Well, we can lock it in the vice too. Grab with some pliers. That'll be our last. We still have a little bit more to go. Oh, we'll just it. get too wacky right now. Sorry, it's the only anvil I have. I can possess the lever. Don't hurt the anvil. Her name's Dora. First cut, that is going to become our tip area. What I'm going to do right now is just quickly work that bevel down a little bit. It's going to be cool. A shout out here, Sam Salvetti Tongs. Tong in the shop, made by Sam Savetti, best tongs in the business. or two heats just to kind of establish it and then once I get into rhythm we can cycle in with the striker. Sound good? Sounds good. I'm going to go over there. You, grab, you yell at me when you want me. Sure. Alright, so now I'm going to start forging the edge bringing it down and hopefully start forming that triangle cross section because the sacks has that cross section. Right now we're just at a rectangle shape so we have to draw that out. this edge, that material that's already there has to be displaced somewhere and what's going to happen is that edge is going to start to expand out and it's going to give a curve to the blade so we're going to have to correct and work with that as we go.
take some of that curve out so it doesn't banana on us a little bit too much. There we go. Starting to look flat. Still got to bring that tip down because you can see that it's bowed up a little bit. Well, not a little bit, way too much. chat just asked the question why didn't he round it before forming the bevel i think what he means is the the curve of the tip you may want to explain how the, that the yeah. first yeah so what happens is we have this uh rectangular cross section sorry i just got some sweat in my eye i don't know what's going on it must be hot in here or something uh when you're forging that material down it has to go somewhere just think about it if, you know if you take some clay and you squeeze it that material has to get pushed off to the side or it's going to get pushed out. And if it gets pushed to the side, which it naturally will, it's going to elongate that edge. So if I just keep hammering on that edge and pushing that material out, it's going to form an arc. So uh, if that answers the question, or if it doesn't... Uh, These guys are freaking... Hey, am I still on mic? These guys on the chat are freaking out because they didn't know we were reading. <laughs> this guy's like, oh, no, wait, I didn't know they were We know, we know everything, we know what you say. This is just like the first time I've come back behind the screen. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we weren't ignoring your questions. I apologize. If there were questions you really wanted to have answered, uh, ask them now and uh, we can uh, try to hit them. It's kind of where we're at right now. I mean, there isn't too much to see, but if you look at the spine, you can tell that that's a lot thicker than the edge, and the edge still has to come down quite a bit. But I'm going to stick this back in the forge, and uh, we're going to work with two hammers striking and moving this material. Uh, the forge reaches 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm just answering a question to somebody oh. on chat. Do you want to come strike? Damn right I want to come strike. Come here, hammer swinger! Uh, now normally, you do it was a sledgehammer. We didn't have one, so that's all we got. I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna go like this at first until I find the rhythm. I'm not gonna do that until I. Yeah, plus we just want to go nice and slow because yeah. it's just forming the edge bevel. Oh, we're doing the edge bevel. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So if you could try to put a little bit of an angle down to it, and let's see. I'm gonna hit this real quick with the. All right. I guess I'll take a welding heat without a striker then. question a little bit further why does that material stretch out you can see this line ever so slightly and at the tip it starts to curve up that's from the material elongating and it's creating that curve I don't know if it'll pick up on camera but I can see it so I know it's there yeah if you guys want to try this at home forging you can be practicing you can practice with play-doh literally you get a bar of play-doh and use your fist as a hammer and just uh and watch how it'll curve and sort of banana itself. 
So when you actually create the curve of a knife upward, at first you forge the profile straight or even down. So when you strike the bevels on the edge, it curves up and counters either the straightness or the counter curve you put in. Ready? I am. I'm trying to give them a camera view, but I get it. All right. Yeah. So what's happening is uh, traditionally, if you're not cheating and using a press and a power hammer. Uh, I don't know why we're not cheating with a power hammer, but okay, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> well, you are my power hammer. They would have strikers where the master would basically hold the piece, and he would hold the hammer, and he would basically say, okay, well, I know where I need to move material. I need to move material here. And then I strike in that spot. And then the striker will strike where I strike, but they're actually the ones doing the work and moving the material in that direction. Because I have to hold on to the piece, I have to think about where it's going to strike, where the material is going to move, and how it's going to be shaped. So basically, I'm just telling my striker with the hammer, that's where I want you to hit. If I hit lightly, the striker hits lightly. If I hit hard, then the striker hits hard. It's just kind of a team system because obviously you can move a whole lot more material with a bigger hammer, but you know, you can only have so much force with one person, but if you have two or three people, you can get a lot more work done a lot faster, a lot more efficiently. Michael's actually trained in real blacksmith and real smithies over in Germany. No, so no, no, I just played one on a reality TV <laughs> show. <laughs> uh, go to go to YouTube and type in uh, Michael Pakula and Ashokan, and you'll find a uh, video of me, Shane Harvey, and him doing a striking pattern on a billet uh, where he was screaming at us in German. Line up in the oh, right, right, right. And then bring it down at a little bit of a... Oh, wait, hold on. All right, I'm going to have to clean this, so... All right. So all this black stuff sticking on it, that's all scale and slag. It basically does not belong on the steel, and if we were to hammer it right now, we would be forging that and we'd be making impressions and dips and devits in our workpiece, and we don't want to do that because later we're going to have to grind that out and we're going to be losing steel. So it's always a good idea to keep your steel as clean as possible, but as you start getting down to your finer thickness, then it's kind of a give and take game because you don't have a lot of time to clean your piece because there isn't so much material there, the heat isn't holding on as long, and your work time is a little bit decreased. You may be wondering why I just flux the blade. I'm not doing a welding operation. Well, if you remember, the uh, the flux is two things. It also reduces the temp uh, melting temperature of that scale. So if I put flux on my workpiece and I bring it up to temperature, then all that scale that's built up on the surface will get loose. Now when I hit the fire pressure, it'll be a lot easier to clean up and get off the surface. Uh, Jeffrey, they just asked a question on chat. Jeffrey, they just asked a question on chat. Yeah, totally. You can See, do it's this not quite forge. up to temperature, but lots of people do. It's kind of getting there. So we'll do one more set with the striking, and then I'll probably clean it up, and then I guess that'll be five yeah, minutes. Yeah, I, I, I ex make sure to explain that you, you would dra be drawing out a tang after this. Alaska. It's quite, it's quite brisk outside. Yeah, pop. That's wet for it. He's popping the scale off. 
That water creates an explosion of steam on the blade and it pops the scale right off. That's Japanese forging technique. Are we striking this heat? Yeah. Yeah, and I'll squeeze the tang out on the press. All right. So we're kind of running out of time, so what we're going to do is we're going to do one more heat with the striking, then I'm going to clean it up on the anvil, then I'm going to put it underneath the press, and I'm going to squeeze out the tang, which is where the handle is going to be going at some point, eventually, when it's done. hear this but the smiths behind me are cackling with laughter Dude, yeah, they're they spray right in my board, face yeah. that was awesome so what that is, is that's a little steam explosion that happens when you compress hot metal and that water is trying to be hot. But it has nowhere to go so it just creates yeah, a little explosion right what happens beard. is it blasts it, the yeah, off the surface that of the scale, scale all in my gets beard. it nice and clean and it creates a very dramatic uh yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, it wasn't like, you know, it didn't stick. So it just, but it was just one of those things, it, you know, all of a sudden you get sprayed and scale the base, just raw! <laughs> Call that a barbaric yawp. We're gonna have to cut that out post-production. to do this without welding at first, Dave, was the question from Jeffrey. What's that? Do you mean without the MIG welder? Yeah, this is uh, this is the last heat that I'm going to do because we only have about two minutes left, and I want to form this tang to kind of get our basic general shape in. So I'm just going to put it underneath the press and squeeze the last part of uh, the billet out, and that's going to be where our, uh, our tang is going to start to form. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yes, you totally can do it without a MIG welder. You can just use heavy ba heavy wire to wire the uh, billet together for the initial tack. That's why I used to do it. Many people have. Austin, what's your question, man? Carbon content of the blade, it's 1095 and 15M20, so about 0.95. Now you may have noticed that when I was working the Babylon, I didn't work too close to my handle material. And that's because I wanted to have a nice cross section, a uh, thick cross section to take that tank out. Because if I start hammering an edge on, and then I go to compress my tank, it's going to get, it's going to roll over, it's going to want to fold, it's going to want to laminate, all kinds of problems. So I want to keep all that mass there. What I'd like to do, I think, a little bit after I have my general shape down, because especially on the sword, if you heat up that section, you have that thin tank. After the broadcast, I'll, I'll log on to the chat 
and uh, type with you guys for a little while to answer uh, all the questions, okay? Because I got I to gotta close the segment out here soon. like I do. If I told him to dance like Tom Cruise in Risky Business, he'd totally get into his underwear. We do not want this. So here we go. Here's the first <coughs> basic shape after the welding operation and consolidation of the sacks. Still a lot more forge work that needs to be done, a lot more shaping grinding, heat treating, all that good stuff, but the basic form is there, the welds are solid. I'm happy with it, I hit it. Yep, it's good. Awesome. awesome. Woo! That was some badass forging there, dude. Yeah, it was okay. Well done. <laughs> Well, that was great. Uh, I hope you guys, I, good luck to all you guys that uh, played in the competition. Uh, obviously, you can't all win, but uh, uh, I hope the three that, and by the way, we'll announce the winners tomorrow during the forging competition. We're going to see a lot more of this, and we'll be working in three men teams. Uh, so it's going to be really cool. I'll explain real quickly the rules of the uh, contest tomorrow. It's pretty innovative. Remember, we've got three forging stations. Um, and the three forging stations have different equipment. We have one very basic forging station with just an anvil and a, and a forge out here with no hydraulic press or anything. And then we've got this with a rolling mill and a hydraulic press over there with just a hydraulic press. Um, and so we're going to split into three teams and we're going to uh, give 10 minutes for the forges to heat up. Uh, during which time the teams can confer on the design of their piece, what they want to make. And then they will, each will have 20 minutes at each station. We're going to rotate them just to screw with them. And uh, at the end of that 60 minutes, regardless of the state, that will be the knife. So it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be an interesting creative process. Most of these guys are you're not used to working with time constraints, so it's going to be an, an interesting challenge. So, uh, okay, this is it for uh, this session of Arctic Fire. Uh, we Don't forget, we have the event that you do not want to miss. We saved the best for last. We really did, and I don't think any smith here is going to get offended with me saying that. We have Peter's uh, Secret Seal of the Sword uh, lecture that's happening at 5 o'clock. No, yes, 5 o'clock uh, our time, uh, Alaska Standard Time. That's 9 p.m. East Coast time. And very correct me if I'm saying that wrong, okay? Um, and uh, it, you want to tune in for it because, like I said, that is, it is the Da Vinci Code of Swords. So until then, we'll see you online.